is transparency? Well, this week we did a little experiment, three experiments really with my son. One of the experiments is just a, a verification kind of thing, okay? And some people say, oh, Bill, you're doing experiments. <laughs> don't hold it against me. Uh, in science, we don't do experiments. In science, we explain experiments. You can do all the experiments you want, but if you don't understand what you're doing, uh, you haven't learned anything from doing your experiments, you're not a scientist, you're not a physicist. You're a physicist, a scientist, if you can explain how that happened, then you're a scientist. But if you do an experiment, you say, okay, here's an experiment, I'll let go of the pen. You let go of the pen and it falls to the floor, to the, my desk in this case. Okay, so I do it, I, you gotta do it repeatable for it to be scientific, right? Okay, let's do it two times at least, okay? <laughs> so we have a, a, a repeatable experiment. We drop the pen two times. You want me to do it a thousand times? It would take a little too long. A million times, the pen falls to the floor, to the center of the earth. Great, so we did the experiment. You, you wanna calculate how fast, all that stuff, go, go do it. I don't care, that's description. That's like saying, uh, I'm gonna describe a chair. You know, it's got four legs, a seat uh, backrest, and uh, two armrests. Great, great math. And what have you explained? And so if I let go of the pen and it drops to the center of the earth and I do it a million times, okay, I learned that the pen falls to the floor. I described it, I can do it mathematically and say how fast it goes, what the acceleration is, 9.8 meters per second square, whatever. What have you explained? We still don't know why, what causes that pen to fall to the floor? And so doing experiments is not science. Science is explaining. We're gonna to try to explain transparency today. So we did a couple of uh, experiments with my son. Here's one of them. And uh, what we do, we put a laser through air and we do it through glass, okay? And then we pour some water in there, okay? And you can see that water goes through, uh, I'm sorry, the laser goes through water as well, okay? One more time, just in case. It goes through air, through glass, and through water, through all three of them, okay, uh, the laser. Here's through air. You can see it goes right through it. Air doesn't stop that laser. Okay, goes through glass, you can see nothing's changed there. And when we pour water in there, it goes through water as well. So it goes through water, through air, and through glass, and all three of them at the same time. Okay, so uh, we proved it. Okay, we proved it. Uh, air, water, and glass are transparent. Proof, please give me my noble. Okay, okay but we didn't stop there. We did another experiment, okay, and uh, this was something similar. And what we did here, we did it with a pencil, and here are the three possibilities. Here's the first one. First through air, okay? Then we put it in glass, and you can see there's a very little change. It's almost perfectly transparent. But when you put water in there, it kind of starts breaking the pencil. It breaks the pencil in two, okay? So you can see how the pencil got broken over there, okay? Okay, so we have uh, proven, again, that uh, these are transparent, okay? Um, you can see right through the water and through the glass, through the air, you can see the pencil. Uh, the only thing that uh, the water, you can say, is uh, kind of distorts the image a little bit. And here was a third one, also along that same line. Okay. And we put two uh, glasses, one with water and the other one without water. And you can see what happens with the one with water as we take it up and down. It distorts the image of the pencil, whereas the glass doesn't. Okay, you see what's happening there? You go up and down with the one with glass only, and it's uh, almost the same image. Whereas when you go with the one that's got a little bit of water in it, that was a curved uh, uh, glass, uh, you can see that it distorts the pencil. And why is that uh, a problem, or why is that significant? Well, because um, here, uh, here you see some of the values for uh, air, water, and glass. And you can see the molecules per cubic centimeter uh, for oxygen, you find 10 to the 19 molecules, okay? Whereas for water in SiO2, glass, right, you find 10 to the 22 molecules. They're more or less uh, in the same boat. There's a little difference there, but they're, they've got the, the same exponent, whereas uh, air doesn't, okay? And there, for comparison, you see CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, okay, also in the 22 range, okay? So we have these three, they're in the 22 range, but look at the uh, refractive index. And you see air, which is close to vacuum, on one, okay, triple zero and a three there. Water, much higher, 1.3, one and one third. And SiO2, it's got a range of 1.4 to 155. In the industry, a semiconductor industry, we use 1.45. But what is strange about that is that you saw the distortion from water when, uh, when we put the pencil inside the water and so on. And it turns out that the refractive index of SiO2 is much, is 
significant, noticeably higher than water. And yet the uh, SiO2 is a perfect transparency, whereas water is not. Okay, so that's my point there, point that I'm trying to make there. Okay, um, so let's look at this. Let's see what's going on. Okay, here's a, a little gift there here. We have this uh, glass of water. We have water in the center there. At the bottom, we have glass. I put that crystal structure of uh, SiO2, and it's fixed. It doesn't move too much, at least. It does move a little bit uh, because it's uh, somewhat fluid, glass is. Water moves a lot more, and I would say air moves even a lot more. Uh, air is less dense than the other two. The other two have more or less, as you saw a minute ago, almost the same density. Okay, okay what happens when we uh, run uh, light through this, uh, this stream? system, in other words, through air, through water, and through glass. Well, here it is. Okay, if you uh, shine light through it, well, you'll find that it goes right through all three of them, which is what we showed just now with the laser. The laser goes right through all three of them. Okay, but we have a little bit of a problem here because see what you see there are waves. But what is a wave? Okay, so let's find out what this wave is. Let's look at it in a little more detail. And a wave is something that looks like this. It's a bunch of vectors. That's what it is. What is a vector? Well, it's uh, got magnitude and direction. It's a mathematical concept. There's no physical object called wave. Wave is a verb. Okay? And you can see the arrows there. Those are the vectors. And they're moving up and down. And they're also moving sideways. It's, it's a very scary stuff. You know, very strange thing. You have these vectors, numbers. They're moving up and down. They also move sideways. Concepts, mathematical concepts that move. Very scary stuff. So there is no such thing as a wave. Anyone using a wave is not doing physics. He's doing math. Okay? The uh, theorist has to tell the crowd what it is that is waving. And there's a whole bunch of people out there that say, well, nothing is waving. We never figured out what it is that's waving. Well, then we will not allow you to use the microphone. You're not allowed to give your talk. You, you have a lot of work to do to figure out what it is that's waving. You should go back to your dark basement, erase your board, and begin brainstorming again. You gotta, you gotta identify what it is that it is that is waving. Until then, you can't use the word wave and say, "Oh, wave is what went through water. Wave is what went through oxygen. A wave is what went through silicon dioxide." You can't do that because there is no such thing as a wave. Wave is forbidden in the word in the world of physics. Okay, so what do the people do using quantum mechanics? Well, they replace the wave with particles. So now we're going to run particles. Through there and say, see, the particles go through air, go through water, and go through glass. Okay, no problem. I mean, we can live with that. What's the problem? The problem, at least from our current uh, understanding, uh, or the way quantum mechanics presents this to the world, is that um, this is their atom. This is their atom, and that's their uh, photon. That's their energy, whatever energy is, a concept also, a mathematical concept. And that blue ball that's going around, that's the electron. And the green little squiggly arrows that are coming out of there, that's light. And it's known as energy also, energy, light, whatever you want to call it. And that's not a physical object either. It turns out that the little ball that's going around not only is a point particle, meaning there's no physical object there called an electron because it has no size. That's the official version. But we have another problem. Even if it did have size and it was a ball, why doesn't it fall to the nucleus? What prevents it from flying out of the atom uh, spontaneously. So until you can answer those questions, you don't even have a hypothesis for what this photon is or what an electron is. We have problems with both. Okay, So you can't use the particle of quantum mechanics. You could use it if the electron and the photon are corpuscles. You know, like in classical mechanics, they used to think in terms of corpuscles, little grains of dust, uh, balls, uh, whatever you want to call those. It was a something. It had diameter. It had size. That's not what the quantum mechanics is, uh, mechanicers <laughs> are talking about. What they're talking about is something that has no size, no volume, zero dimensional, okay, no radius, no diameter. We're talking about a nothing. Why? Because they're not. They're talking about a function. They're talking about a um, an equation. That's what it is. A number. So you can't use the quantum particle quotations on that word particle. You you can't use that because it's not a particle. It's not a physical object for the purposes of physics. You cannot, you're not allowed to give a physical interpretation with that concept, okay? Because a particle is not an object, it's an abstract concept. It's a mathematical concept. More specifically, it's an equation, a function, okay? So you can't use those. But if you're going to simulate with corpuscles, okay, then these are the variables that you have to consider when you're looking at transparency, at what goes through air, water, 
class. Okay, and here you see uh, the different variables that you might encounter that you have to consider. This is more or less a brainstorm here. Okay, uh, for interaction, the corpuscle either strikes an atom, uh, travels through the atomic diameter. Remember, um, Rutherford said, Ernest R Rutherford said, an atom is mostly empty space, and that's what people repeat today as dummies because they don't know any better. Because if it's mostly empty space, again, you got to explain why the electron doesn't fly away. Okay, what's holding the electron to the proton, assuming the electron was a ball, a little dust particle, or, you know, has size. And so they can't explain either. So they don't have a physical interpretation. But they say, okay, assuming it is a corpuscle, uh, it goes through the uh, center of the atom, it goes through anywhere within the volume of the atom, or it can go uh, between atoms. So those are the three possibilities as far as interaction. Either it collides, okay, with the atom, it goes through the atom, meaning really the proton in the center, like Rutherford did. He sent atoms directly at that center and they bounce back, right? So it either collides, bounces back, okay, ricochets, uh, reflects, goes through, or goes through in between two atoms, the space between two atoms. Those are the possible interactions of uh, uh, photon with uh, matter, okay? Density, uh, a few molecules per centimeter cube, uh, many molecules per centimeter cube. Is transparency an issue of uh, how many molecules, how much substance a thing has? Okay, that's another issue you got to consider, another variable possibility. How about motion? Well, uh, of the substance, right? Uh, well, it could be a solid, a liquid, you know, fluid, or gaseous. And, you know, those are a function of temperature, but the deal is, you know, is, is transparency an issue of how solid something is? Okay, that's another variable you have there, uh, another factor. Frequency, well, uh, we can't really use frequency if you're going to use the wave unless you identify what the wave is, what it is that's waving. you got to identify that. But assuming you can identify that, well, then uh, you have three possibilities. Either it's within the visible range, okay, uh, or outside the visible range. Either it's uh, below... Um, um, infrared or above ultraviolet okay so so those are the possibilities there okay and so um how do these people answer these questions which ones are they going to use to explain transparency here's uh how stuff works and they chose uh, really that density one you know whether there's few molecules or many molecules uh, how stuff works says air is a gas Compared to a solid, air contains very few atoms and is very light. Think about a balloon filled with air compared to a balloon filled with sand. The air balloon is incredibly light compared to the sand balloon, okay? That's because there are many more atoms in sand than in air. So they're going to do this on a basis of how much matter there is in there, okay? Because air contains so few atoms, light waves run into very few, few of them, and when they shine through air. Uh, so the air looks transparent. If you put enough dust in the air, the particles of dust absorb the light and the air stops being transparent. Okay, so uh, how stuff works says, well, this is an issue of, um, of how much matter you've got there. I guess how many walls of atoms. And a lot of people have this notion also that it's a question of how, how, much, uh, how many uh, atoms there are width-wise. You know, how, how, much, how many atoms the uh, beam of light has to uh, go through. Another fellow says, no, the, this is totally wrong, which gives me an idea that they still don't have it settled. Okay? I mean, if How Stuff Works, which is a pretty prominent site on the Internet, gives a wrong answer, that means the mechanics don't have any idea how this thing really works. They're all kind of you know, giving ideas, brainstorming ideas. And this fellow says, quantity of atoms have no bearing on transparency. If the chemical bonds in a substance have the right energy to absorb in the visible spectrum, you can see through it. If they absorb in the infrared and ultraviolet instead, such as glass, light travels through. And so again, they're talking about this frequency wave that you see there at the bottom, uh, visible range, uh, above visible range, or below the visible range. Okay, this is what this fellow is suggesting. Okay, and this is more or less the party line today because, um, uh, and uh, by the way, this fellow does um, uh, give an example, and he does it with iodine. He says, look, if you have a glass, okay, out there, a beaker, you can see right through the beaker, okay? But if you put iodine in an iodine gas, which is lighter than glass, in other words, it's uh, less dense than gas, you, suddenly you can't see through there. You know, it, it, you can see it becomes more and more opaque. And the question is, you know, then it's not an issue of how many atoms you have in there because there you see it. Um, the gas has, is less dense than glass, 
and yet uh, glass you can see through and through this you can't, which is more or less what I said about, you know, the, what you saw earlier about the refractive index through glass versus refractive index through water. Okay, okay um, let me get rid of this. Ah, let me get rid of this too. Okay, uh, so the party line is essentially uh, that. It says that um, uh, the, the uh, light is knocking on an electron. And remember, uh, a little electron ball has no size, and yet this photon, which also has no size, is going to hit this no size electron. And it's going to hit it so that it knocks it into a different energy level. And so you wonder how this, how a photon, man, you know, it's got, it's got very good uh, aim. It's going to hit this non-existent electron and move it into a higher energy level. Does that make any sense to you? You know, a zero-dimensional photon hitting a zero-dimensional electron. And even if it did hit, I mean, how many photons are you going to need to hit one of these electrons? I mean, how many electrons does hydrogen have? Uh, like one? <laughs> okay, so hopefully you throw a shower of photons to hit that electron and, uh, you know, boost it to a higher or lower energy level, right? Okay, so uh, this is more or less the, uh, I can get it up here. Give me a second here. Uh, this is the uh, version of uh, the establishment. Materials are transparent to those wavelengths of light. Again, wavelength, what is that? I don't know. I don't know what a wave is. For which there is no mechanism within the material to absorb those wavelengths. Okay? Glass, electrons require much more energy before they can skip from one energy band to another and back again. Okay, so again, we're saying uh, the photons have such good aim, they hit this non-existent electron, the zero-dimensional electron, and boost it to a different energy level. That's the explanation. Consequently, photons of visible light travel through glass instead of being absorbed or reflected. Okay, and they continue. Okay, here's uh, the other version, uh, the uh, complementary part to this. Okay, it says glass, silicon dioxide, absorbs light in the infrared and the ultraviolet wavelength ranges. Infrared radiation can stimulate mechanical vibrations in the molecular bonds of the material, hence is absorbed. Ultraviolet radiation is energetic enough, remember high frequency, right, to free some electrons from the molecular bonds, thus is absorbed, okay? In the range between infrared and ultraviolet radiation, in other words, the visible range, neither atomic vibrations nor electron transitions are stimulated. So those wavelengths are transmitted and the material is transparent. These are their explanations today, okay? What's the problem? Again, the problem we have is that um, they don't use objects, they don't use things, they use mathematical concepts, they're reifying these concepts, turning them into physical objects. They talk about electrons when electron is a zero-dimensional nothing, and they talk about photons, which is another zero-dimensional nothing. They talk about energy bands, which is a mathematical concept, we have no physical object in front of us, yet they're trying to give you a physical interpretation for transparency. They're trying to explain to you why light, uh, why um, uh, uh, oxygen and other air, uh, water and glass are transparent. Okay, so, I mean, if they're going to later on say that that's just philosophy, well, okay, then why did you try to do philosophy in the first place? Why did you try to explain it? Why didn't you stay within the realm of math and just do your stupid equations? Why did you have to come into physics and try to give it a physical interpretation, which is bunk, which is nonsense, and then at the end say, well, after all, it's, we don't understand it, it's philosophy anyways, it's not part of our discipline, it's not part of science. If it's not, then why the hell did you try to give a physical interpretation and give the semblance of knowledge, give the impression that you knew something? This is where the problem is. Okay, what is it under the rope model? Here's a, this is our version, okay? Um, first, we go with the variables, and they're similar, but a little different because we have interconnectivity. Remember, uh, the rope model says that all atoms in the universe are interconnected, and they're connected by uh, paratwined DNA-like ropes. Okay, so we have two threads, they're twined, it torques, and it stimulates both atoms simultaneously. Light travels both ways, so to speak. In other words, the torsion happens or impacts the atoms at the two ends at the same time. Okay? That's why I see you, you see me. Uh, the um, ropes are pumping in both directions simultaneously. Okay, the rope ends in an atom. That's the connectivity. Or it can run through the atom. Remember, what is uh, our atom? Our atom is a balloon, and we're saying it runs through the atom, okay? That's another possibility. Or it can run between two atoms, okay? Extend, extend between two atoms, okay? Uh, motion, again, we have a solid, fluid, and gaseous, you know, depending on how fluid something is, okay? 
frequency, now we can talk about link length. Not wavelength, because we don't know what a wave is. And these people are still trying to figure that out. They're in their dark basement trying to brainstorm, find out what this wavy thingy is. And we've already told them here we do have a physical object. It's a, a rope. Looks more or less like this. This is what a rope looks like. Okay, Two threads twined around, DNA-like. No questions asked, hopefully. Okay, Very straightforward. And uh, we're talking about link length, the length of a link. Okay, There's a link. Okay, And um, so if it's within the visible range, Okay, between uh, infrared and ultraviolet, which is a question of how long the link is, okay? uh, or if it's outside, either below infrared, above ultraviolet. Those are the constraints. And then density, again, how many molecules uh, per centimeter cube? Okay? And there is a, an experiment you should do at home. You know, let me get this out of here. Okay. And it looks more or less like this. You take a laser pointer, okay, I'm going to shine it at my, hopefully you can see it there, see it there, okay, black shirt, okay, and if, if you put a cardboard in front, you can see that I'm making the, uh, I can't do both at the same time, okay, there it is, see, it disappears when I put the uh, cardboard in front of it, look how thin it is, very thin, okay, yeah, you can see it, very thin piece of cardboard. And the laser doesn't go through it. But the laser, as you just saw, went through water, through air, a lot more atoms there. In fact, don't take my word for it, go to the nearest pool, swimming pool near your home. You can see to the bottom of, I don't know, 10 feet of water, you can see your reflection down at the bottom. That means light went from you all the way to the bottom, through all those same atoms, all the way to your eye again. That's why you can see yourself reflected down there unless you believe uh, uh, you know, that you're reflected from the top, but you, know, you, you can see things at the bottom of the pool. So you can see through that whole layer of water. And certainly that whole layer of water has a little more thickness, meaning a lot more uh, uh, material, a lot of more atoms, a lot more molecules than this piece of cardboard. So it's not a question of how much matter there is. It's primarily a uh, Transmission in the case of quantum mechanics, if they could explain what is uh, going through there, what corpuscle or whatever, what particle, what thing is going through there. In the case of uh, the rope, all we have is one atom connected to another atom, which is connected to another atom by a DNA-like rope entity. Okay, and it looks more or less like this. Okay, here you see it. Okay, so we have uh, light going to the water, going right through air. Why? Because it's connected to all these atoms. Okay, and of course, I've only shown two ropes here, and you, you have to think of this also not as something moving, as you see there, because that changes from second to second. Okay, what we have is ropes attached to ropes, and what is being not transmitted but relayed are the signals from one atom to another. Okay, that's why you know these uh, uh, what quantum says essentially is correct. It's a question of transmission. It's not that uh, light goes through all these atoms, it's that it's connected to the atom and the atom retransmits the signal by relaying it. It receives this, uh, this vibration and it retransmits it to another atom which re retransmits it to another atom. It's a relay race, okay? And again, those atoms uh, are connected to each other and so they receive the same stimulus all the way down the line. So it's another uh, mechanism that we're proposing, a physical mechanism that you can sink your teeth into and that's that uh, it's not transmitted because the way they explain it in quantum mechanics is light hits an atom, strikes it, right? Because it throws this little photon ball, which is not a ball, that hits the atom, really hits the electron, which is not a ball either. It's a nothing. But somehow it hits it, very good aim. And by doing so, uh, that electron is able to retransmit that photon to another atom which receives, whose electron receives and retransmits it and so on down the line. So it's a relay race, but it's, uh, in quantum it's not a relay race because it's, uh, it's a hitting race. Okay? One hits the other one and it's a chain reaction in a sense. Under the rope model, it's a relay race because one atom sends the signal to another, the torsion signal to another, which retransmits that same torsion signal to another. Why? Because that atom is pumping. It's pumping. Uh, remember, it's a balloon. And that balloon is expanding and contracting, quantum jump, and that's what's being stimulated. That retransmits, uh, relays, that same signal to the atom behind it and so on the line. So, yeah, it's primarily a, um, a mechanism of relay. That's what it is under the rope model. 
Okay, let's look at our conclusions today. Okay, here we have it. Um, air, water, and glass are transparent. And I have to state that because there are people who, when they're, they're asked that question, especially if you go to Quora, they go on a tangent and say, well, you know, if you pour ink inside the water, <laughs> and they go off on all these tangents. No, 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 no. Let's bring rational people in. Let's, let's see if we can address the question. And the question is, are air, water, and glass transparent? The answer is yes, period. Boom, stop, okay? Yes, they are transparent. Okay, transparency is not a function of quantity of substance, how thick something is. It's a question of whether um, it can re, uh, light can be retransmitted, that atom has the ability to retransmit. Remember, you can have water, for example, and it's completely clear. You can see right through it. You put some uh, red ink in there, you know, and suddenly it gets cloudy and it doesn't, you can't see through that red ink for some reason. So it's the red ink, the stuff that you put in there that somehow is preventing the transmission of that light. Now it reflects that light. It absorbs and only uh, allows the uh, dispersion of uh, this red light, which is being reflected back to your eyes. Okay, and um, under the rope model, uh, retransmission is relay. Okay, it's a relay type of race. Okay, I just explained that. Quantum mechanics has no justification for the transverse wave. Quantum mechanics proposes that a particle is a function or an equation. Therefore, both quantum mechanics proposals are irrational. They cannot explain a physical mechanism. They cannot provide a physical interpretation to transparency.